Professionalism, it's who we are. Conversations with North Carolina Lawyers, a production of the North Carolina Bar Association's Professionalism Committee in association with the North Carolina Bar Association. This is the first in a series of continuing legal education videos featuring conversations with North Carolina lawyers about professionalism-related topics and offering one hour of ethics CLE credit. Let's begin with some introductory remarks by Chief Justice Mark Martin. Hello, I'm Mark Martin, and I have the distinct privilege of serving as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of North Carolina and as head of the judicial branch of our state government. We live in a time of rapid change in technology, in demographics, and in our economy. These changes are affecting our courts and our profession in unprecedented ways. At the same time, there are some things that do not change and some things that should not change. Professionalism has been a defining characteristic of the legal profession for ages. Values such as competence, confidentiality, and loyalty are essential to our legal system and to the success of lawyers in their practice and in their communities. These values have withstood the test of time. They have weathered fundamental changes in our society in times past, and I am confident that they will remain a key to the vitality of our profession in the future. Article 1, Section 35 of our state constitution states that a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles is absolutely necessary to preserve the blessings of liberty. That precept applies equally to the study of professionalism. Being a lawyer is tough. Practicing law in this day and age means facing many pressures that can challenge our commitment to professionalism. Billable hours, demanding clients, high stakes representation, and contentious opposing counsel. Although the design of our adversarial system is effective for resolving disputes, it can also create an environment where zealous advocacy may cross the line into personal rivalry or unhealthy competition. While professionalism is easy to talk about as an abstract virtue, it can often be challenging to put into practice. It is not always clear what the professional course of action is, and there is not always a lot of time to make a decision. The consequences of our decisions can have a profound effect on our clients and their lives and on our own careers as well. Even decisions that do not implicate the rules of professional conduct can result in lost clients or significant harm to a lawyer's reputation. It is important for each of us as lawyers to make a frequent recurrence to the values inherent in professionalism. We need to understand not only why professionalism is important, but also what professionalism looks like day to day. Professionalism is more than just fulfilling our ethical duties. It is about going above and beyond, being above reproach, and aspiring to the highest standards of civility and integrity that will earn the respect of our colleagues, our clients, and our communities. One of the best ways to understand professionalism is to hear about the real-life experiences of seasoned lawyers who have demonstrated a high level of professionalism during stressful situations. During colonial times, aspiring lawyers learned these lessons while completing an apprenticeship with a licensed attorney before being admitted to the bar. In more recent times, young lawyers may navigate professionalism issues over coffee or a meal with a more experienced lawyer. I personally have benefited a great deal from my mentors. I have learned a lot about how to be a better lawyer, a better judge, and a better person by seeking out wisdom from those more experienced than myself. Unfortunately, despite our profession's strong tradition of mentoring, recent times have seen a decrease in this valuable practice. Whether it's the result of the ever-increasing specialization of the bar, or the intensive time demands of modern legal practice, or perhaps even the difficulty in navigating conflicts and confidentiality. More and more young lawyers are practicing law without a network of experienced attorneys to help them learn not just how to represent a client, but how to do so professionally. This new video series, produced by the North Carolina Bar Association Professionalism Committee, collects wisdom and hard-earned lessons from legal leaders throughout our state and makes them accessible for the benefit of all lawyers in North Carolina. Some of our state's foremost judges and attorneys have taken time to participate, and I would strongly encourage you to take the lessons that they share to heart, no matter your age or experience. 
At the end of the video, you will find citations and links to relevant source materials, such as the Rules of Professional Conduct and the North Carolina State Bar Ethics Opinions. In addition, I encourage you to contact the North Carolina Bar Association and the Professionalism Committee with feedback and suggestions for future installments of this video series. Members of the legal profession inevitably face ethical dilemmas. It's not a question of if, but when. Our hope is that this endeavor and others will help us as a profession to carry the torch of professionalism forward for generations to come. Please enjoy. There are three topic modules in this video addressing professionalism, mentoring, and service. Links to the reference materials are provided on the North Carolina Bar Association on-demand website for this program, and you may download them from there. Your comments, feedback, and suggestions for new topics are welcomed and can be provided in the course evaluation survey found at the conclusion of this program. To be a lawyer, an attorney, or counselor called to serve the cause of justice in a society founded on the notion that every individual has inalienable rights and the government exists not to take away those rights but to vindicate them is a noble calling indeed a calling both inspirational and aspirational justice grounded in truth is our lodestar cynics might laugh at that and the press is full of books talking about the cynicism of our profession I am not ashamed to affirm these virtues. This is what we're about, not the cynicism that the chroniclers talk so much about. Module number one, professionalism. Professionalism is defined as the conduct, aims, or qualities that characterize or mark a profession or a professional person. The skill, good judgment, and polite behavior that is expected from a person who is trained to do a job well. We come in all shapes and sizes. We can't all be the same person, but there are qualities in good lawyers that I think all of us can pick up on and can attempt to apply to ourselves and, and make ourselves a, a better advocate, a better lawyer. Professionalism is a broader uh, thing. I think I see it more broadly and encompassing uh, all aspects of practice by a good lawyer uh, and ethics as well, but it's something that uh, you sh should aspire to do and, and, and whereas ethics is something you must do, it's, it's best to try to be the best professional you can be and in that encompasses civility. I've seen so many lawyers and people in other aspects of life who are abrasive and unpleasant and uh, trying to be controlling of everything and they don't really succeed in, in what they're trying to accomplish. They, they make a lot of enemies and make life more difficult for them. Uh, I don't mean you just got to be a, a, a namby-pamby in, in, in uh, everything you're doing, but if you can be civil and firm, then I think people appreciate that very much and uh, certainly more pleasant to work with. It's important not only that you conduct yourself professionally, you present yourself professionally. Um, you know, you may have the, the, the best uh, running car uh, in, in the world, but if it's rusty and the windows are broken and the lights don't work, then people are gonna be hesitant. And, and I sit in juvenile court often, and when I talk to the juveniles, I tell them that before you open your mouth, before you say anything, people are gonna look at you and judge you by your appearance. And that may not be fair, but that's how we are in human nature. You know, how do you hold yourself? How do you speak? Um, how do you present yourself? And they're gonna make an initial judgment. And then it's up to you to kind of either buy into that judgment or, or dispel it. And so it's very important that attorneys present themselves in a professional way. The way they dress, the way they speak, the way they carry themselves, the way they present themselves in court. And so those attorneys that 
do themselves a disservice, do the, do the, uh, does the profession a disservice, and eventually will do a disservice to their clients are those that are not professional or emotional or disrespectful to their clients, disrespectful to the opposing counsel, to the judge. Because what you do then is you diminish your message. You're not being taken as a professional. And if you're not being taken as a professional, neither is your argument or your advocacy on behalf of your client. We distinguish professionalism and civility. Uh, like I said, when we're talking about professionalism, we really are talking about the work that they do, how they do it, being dependable, following through, the integrity that they show in the way that they engage the work. But when we talk about civility, we really change the conversation to something different because we are trying to get them to move beyond uh, what we think is a mistaken understanding now that civility is about capitulation or being weak or just being overly polite. We think that civility instead is more about how you work with people to reach a goal. And in law, we have a framework that is an adversarial system. So if you don't have civility as a part of that, and many times we don't reach the right outcomes. Being a professional means that you have to be responsible. You have to be dependable. You have to be a person of integrity in the way that you embrace your work. It's being knowledgeable. It's being a fierce advocate. It's being civil. It's being well prepared. It's being a person who returns his or her phone calls, who does the things that they ought to be doing on an orderly basis, uh, and a person who has courage of conviction. From my perspective, the law has always been a way of life and not a job. It's just a seamless part of my life. It's part of who I am. It's not who I am, but it's part of who I am. And that uh, if you think of the law as a way of life, I, I've never one day in my career hated to go to work. I once heard Judge Donald Stevens in a CLE program say that one reason Wade Smith is such a good lawyer is you could not out nice him. Wade was going to be nice no matter what the circumstances to everybody. Uh, and it's a good strategy. It's clearly paid off for him in terms of the results he gets. There may be a given situation where you've got to use other tactics, but I think the, the bottom line answer is to advise the young lawyer, always be the best professional you can be, no matter what's occurring on the other side. I think that it's the responsibility of a lawyer to, to give a good impression for the profession. Um, it certainly um, is what we all would like to see. And um, I think the way you uh, conduct yourself, uh, both in practice and in outside, the way you present yourself and uh, try to be uh, someone who's recognized as being kind of a decent guy <laughs> is a lot better than uh, just don't be not caring what you what you look like or how, how you speak or how you write or what you're doing I mean giving thought to what it is you're representing more than yourself and uh, I think that's crucial I think there is something to learning to accept the realities of life and the realities of of law practice, which are not all success and not all glory and not all uh, glamorous. An awful lot of it is just darn hard work and uh, um, preparation and application and all the things that are pretty basic to success. I think the most important thing in not only dealing with a client, but with people in general is to be honest and, and straight up with them and and uh, they people recognize that and and know that you're you're trying to do what's best for them I think that if you will spend time uh, and I urge lawyers that I've worked with spend time getting to know your clients but also know their business or what it is they're doing and um, try to uh, 
gauge your work with what it is they need. What I would really like in a client is first one who understands what we're doing, second a client who feels comfortable with me, um, and third a client who is willing to take the time and effort necessary to make it easy for me to represent that client. People come to lawyers to assist them in their needs and many times it's an emotional need um, that's surrounded or encompassed in law. And, th and that lawyer needs to understand that that person they're dealing with is uh, emotional and rightfully so or, or and make sure that when they're, they're dealing with that individual they take that into account. But they have a responsibility to kind of understand that person's needs and apply the law and then present it in court in a professional setting. And I think sometimes lawyers not necessarily intentionally, but get caught up in that emotion. And so the, the best lawyers I see understand the, the influence of the person's emotion that they're dealing with, or the case, the emotion of the case, but present it in a professional way. Um, you often hear it's an adversarial setting. Um, we disagree, but we don't have to be disagreeable. And so I think that's very important uh, in our profession. It is a profession, and so to act professional. And many times it becomes emotional, but you don't have to let emotion sway the way you present yourself in court. And so those attorneys, prosecutors, private attorneys, um, court personnel that can present their case, present them in a professional way without becoming emotional, I think carry themselves well, carry the profession well, and also do their clients the best service. I think the first thing to keep in mind uh, is that you have to expect to have uncontrollable or difficult clients from time to time. And you have to be proactive. I know most law firms now have a standard letter which they ask a client to sign, uh, the client letter. And it sets forth a lot of things including the fees and other things that you might, uh, might do. And, uh, in the course of representing the client. I think it's important to also put in to, to that letter that uh, you and other members of the firm are going to do everything they can to pursue the client's interests within the provisions of the rules of professional conduct, the rules of civil procedure, and the rules of evidence. And that you also would expect the client to help you uh, by being prompt in response to your your inquiries by assisting you and collecting the documents and everything else that you need to support the client's case. Um, because if you have that in the letter, that gives you ammunition to go back to the client later and say, look, this is what we agreed upon and this is how we're going to have to handle the case. It also helps if you have a phrase saying to the effect that you will at times, as their lawyer, make decisions. Uh, based upon these various rules uh, which have to be made. Don't ever let your client push you into, into offering advice before you're ready to offer it. Uh, I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying, let me think about that and I'll get back to you. A big part of the problem is that the law has gotten so complex over the years, uh, it's hard for a, a, a client to know and understand what's involved in his matter. He may bring something to you that's quite complex, but it wouldn't seem on the surface that it is. And unless you try to educate that client uh, to what he's got, and you just take off and start working, you're gonna get an unhappy result. When I have clients who, who are uh, uncontrollable, who make excessive demands, I think the best way to approach those problems is just have a sit down with that person and, and be honest with them. If you do get into a situation in which a client insists that you do something that you just can't do, that's unethical, um, or that's just solely unpro unprofessional that, it, that you just can't do it, then you have to tell them no and explain why. I recall a case I had in Durham County Superior Court when I was probably three or four years into the practice of law. The opposing counsel was from two or three counties away, um, but was sort of a bantam rooster type. And the point came in the hearing in which 
The judge rapped his gavel and he said, Mr. So-and-so, that makes twice you've been impolite to Mr. Richard and once you've been impolite to me this morning. And if it happens again, you're going to jail. Well, it didn't happen again, at least in that hearing. So I think sometimes you let it go. And if you've got a judicial officer in charge, you depend on the judge to take care of it. I think the politeness of a judge to everyone in the courtroom, most especially the members of the jury, because so many times you have people that are there for the first time, they've never sat on a jury before, and they feel kind of corralled or harnessed and what do I do, what am I doing here, oh, I need to be at work. Uh, and a judge can make that jury feel so, so much at ease. I really think the best judges are those who her hold our feet as attorneys to the fire. Um, uh, because that engenders, for the most part, respect for the judicial system itself and for the rules that we have to follow. Um, they can be friendly when they do it. They can smile when they do it. Uh, but doing that, I think, forces us to be better attorneys. When I was a young lawyer, it was a very personally interactive profession. You were interacting with your law partners, with your clients, with the other members of the bar, with a broader public. You walk into most law firms today and it's like a tomb. Everybody's at their computer. I think while email and the other technological advances certainly have their advantages, they also um, have decreased the personal dimensions of law practice and made it easier, I think, for lawyers to be uncivil with one another. It's much easier to pop off to vent in an email than it is if you're face to face with someone and maybe face to face with them again in another matter a month later. I think every one of us feels at some point or another, another we've run across a lawyer on the other side who's difficult to get along with. I think, again, uh, you have to be proactive. Uh, you really should not have any contact with a lawyer on the opposite side of the matter that you're involved in until you find out something about that lawyer. And if you find out that that particular lawyer is going to be difficult to, to get along with, I think you have to be proactive yourself. One of the best examples of how to do that occurred in a case about 10 years ago. Um, this was a case in which the parties hated each other. Uh, and the, the animosity was deeply seated. When I learned who was on the other side, uh, I called him and asked him if we could get together. Uh, and I went over to his office. And here's what he did. As soon as I walked in, he said, Jim, I know our clients don't like each other a whole lot. And there's not much that we can do about that. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to do everything I can to make things as easy and comfortable as we can while we represent our clients' interests. And that was an excellent example of how to treat another attorney and how to head off any problems in the future. For the most part, people will respond if you think um, their conduct's not acceptable or not appropriate. People can't deal with a, with a term that's inappropriate. They just can't. I remember one other lawyer that I seemed to end up uh, on opposing sides in domestic cases with who just couldn't make an argument in a domestic case in court without questioning the way I had handled the case. I never did object to that, I think I could have, but I always watched the judge, and the judge was not smiling about that. So I think lawyers hurt themselves when they choose to make personal attacks on opposing counsel. I learned that at that time, you don't take out your frustration uh, with other lawyers, or judges for that matter, by acting out. You find another way to take out that frustration. When I see a lawyer who um, has reverence for the law in our system or who, for whom 
a law is a meaningful way of life. I know I'm in the presence of a professional. Uh, you know, civility is a part of that, but it's not. That's not the end of the game. Uh, when I see a lawyer who's passionate about their client's causes and he works hard and he's prepared, I love to go in a courtroom, and I think that's what I'll miss the most. And the other lawyer talks, and I think, God, what am I going to say about that? <laughs> you know, I get caught up in their argument and impressed by what they are doing, but it it stimulates you to to, to do better than than you might otherwise do. It also involves making sure the other attorney knows that you respect them and you respect their abilities. And you understand sometimes they're gonna to have to take a position that you don't want to take. They may not be able, because of their client's feelings about it, to give you an extension of time. You may have to apply to the, to the court for it. Uh, they may not feel comfortable in agreeing with you on certain issues and you have to respect that. Now, if it comes to the point where the two of you can't agree on anything, uh, then I think you have to use the rules of civil procedure and uh, the rules of professional conduct and the rules of evidence to make sure that everything you do is well prepared so that you give them less reason to be difficult to get along with. I am many things. I am a father and I am a husband. Um, I am uh, a Yankee, um, but I'm also Hispanic. I, I was born and raised Hispanic. I'm very proud of my Hispanic heritage. I'm Puerto Rican. So I think it's important that organizations encourage um, those interests, those minority interests, uh, whether it's uh, the bar organization, the association, whether it's the, 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 the governmental bar, and law schools. And, and I remember Campbell University doing a very good job when I became there. Uh, me being one of the very few minorities is to encourage my participation there and encourage that organization and, and the, the faculty and staff did a very good job in assisting us in establishing those organization and outreaching that to it's th throwing a wider net you know and the wider net you throw the more inclusive you are the better ideas come into and, the, and I think the better the organization can be. Well I fully expect them to um, zealously represent their client the um, code of professional responsibility requires that of them, but that can get out of hand. Uh, I spent almost seven years on the State Bar Ethics Committee, and that's a rule that got debated from time to time as to whether we should modify it because it was being abused. Lawyers were taking the mandate to zealously represent a client uh, to mean anything goes and anything doesn't go. The aspirational statements in the Code of Professional Conduct also call for courtesy to opposing counsel. Um, and I think it really um, gets down to the golden rule. Um, it's not just the Code of Professional Conduct, it's doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or if you're a person of faith uh, following the second greatest commandment. Um, loving your neighbor as yourself. Uh, and I think in the end, uh, it, it, it's usually the best strategy to do that. And certainly gives counsel a much better chance to resolve things if you've got an open relationship with opposing counsel in which you can always talk about things. The day that we all decide we're not going to obey law, we collapse the system and we fall into chaos. There are expected norms. Civility is a part of that. It's part of what makes it work. If you don't do that, you end up with entrenched uh, divisions and separations. If you embrace civility, then it allows you to have connections with people and you can see more commonalities and how to actually reach a, a more just outcome than we believe that you can reach when people are appearing to be angry with each other. We don't think that being adversaries means being angry. Remember, that person in front of you could be you, it could be your mom, it could be your dad. Um, and so just treat people how you want to be treated. Um, it's kind of funny um, that I am a, an attorney. Um, I am very shy. I don't like standing up in front of groups of people and I hate wearing a tie. 
So, uh, I picked a wonderful profession to be in and an elected official to boot. So, push your personal limits, push your personal limits to help those around you. Remember, it's a wonderful prof profession. You have chosen a wonderful profession and worked hard to get here. So, advance the profession. Um, think outside the box. Think that, remember that person you're dealing with. And I, I remember this when I was in private practice. Uh, dealing with uh, an expired registration for one little person may be just as severe as a, a foreclosure for another. And so remember, it's uh, the person you're dealing with, it comes to you, whether for small matters or large matters, for looking for your guidance. Remember that they're a person. I mean, ethics, is, I'm a boater. <laughs> they're like channel markers. They keep you from running the ground. But, um, Professionalism is, is more than ethics, it's more than civility. Um, it's who you are as a, as a lawyer. And I think if we ever, the people, I've got a theory. I, I'm, there's, no, there's no data that supports my theory, I'm sure, but the people who burn out practicing law and who leave the practice of law came to the practice because they wanted a job for whatever reason. And I think it's a tough job if it's not something that really turns you on. You know, it'd be like being a doctor uh, and, and not wanting to deal with sick people. I mean, people who come to us have problems and they need to take their problem and put it on your desk and know that it's your problem when they leave and not leave with three more problems. And uh, I think lawyers who don't like the practice or who burn out from the practice maybe shouldn't have been lawyers to start with. Key takeaways from module number one, professionalism. Professionalism is a way of life, part of who you are as a lawyer, a citizen, and a member of your community. It is the personal dimension of law practice. Professionalism is always a good strategy, no matter what is occurring around you. It is always clear to others when they are in the presence of a professional. You are representing more than yourself and your client. You are reflecting the profession and the system of justice by how you conduct yourself. Professionalism encompasses all aspects of lawyering, civility and respect for opposing counsel and the court, ethical decision-making and personal integrity, being knowledgeable and well-prepared, following up and following through, and understanding your client's business, their legal needs, and managing their expectations from you. Ours is a profession grounded in these higher purposes and wedded to public service. We're committed to the pursuit of justice, unencumbered by agenda or prejudice. We're committed to affirming freedom, individual worth, and equal opportunity, grounded in due process and the presumption of innocence. We're committed to accurate application of the law and excellence in its expression. All of this, of course, requires and presumes the humility by which we may be guided in the paths of justice and mercy, a noble calling indeed. Module number two, mentoring. A mentor is defined as a trusted counselor or guide one who teaches or gives advice or guidance to another, one who is a positive, guiding influence. I think to begin with, a good mentor has to be willing to give the mentee some time. None of us get out of law school knowing how to do very much. We know the concepts, we know how to find things we need, but there's a tremendous amount of practical knowledge about the practice of law uh, that nobody gets out of law school knowing. And they've got to be willing to take the time to do that. At the same time, I think a good mentor um, finds the right point to turn the mentee loose and let them um, go on their own. I think not only all uh, presenting things in a simplified way, but I think patience is the key. I think that the mentor needs to be patient with the mentee, and I think the mentee needs to be patient as, as well. 
I began to actually keep a journal about people who I admired and why I admired them. Who I admired them, I just literally wrote down what it is about them I admired. And it helped form my view about a, a lot of things in the professional. So I call those people involuntary mentors. And I had dozens of those. And I would urge young lawyers to, to do just that. Look at people you admire and try to figure out why in the world you admire that person. What is it that sets that person apart from other people? You need to find someone who has walked the path that you're trying to walk so that you can get the advice that you need and the guidance that you need. And what I've found is, is that sometimes it has to do with the law, but more often it has to do with just walking uh, beside young attorneys when they when they come along because when a new attorney comes into the, to the courtroom some of the first times they don't really know the clerks they don't really even maybe know where to sit as I didn't know the first time when I was walking into the courtroom so I think we as attorneys have a, have a responsibility to keep our eyes open for new lawyers who are who are uh, coming into town and just befriending them take time to uh, invite them for a meal um, they don't need to be in our firm uh, for us to sit down and talk to them and help them um, kind of through some of the nervous times. And I've tried to make that um, as a practice. I've tried to, uh, to think, uh, what can I do to really help young folks as they come along, young attorneys? I think mentors are people that they have this easygoingness about them um, and the ability to listen and connect. And um, one individual who I only know recently is Mel Wright, who works at the bar. And anyone who knows Mel Wright knows that he has that easygoing nature about him. You can sit down, he immediately makes you feel comfortable. He feels, um, you feel like he listens uh, and it welcomes your input. And so I think those that mentor, those that guide or educate or assist others in any aspect or any profession to include the practice of law, have those qualities, those easygoing, welcoming natures that allows the individual that they're, they're gaining a rapport with to open up and feel comfortable. Uh, Mel Wright, I think, is a great example of one. I comment to young lawyers in our firm who send me long emails. I call them and say, why didn't you just call me and say that or ask me the question? There's something about personal contact. When I would go into Russell Robinson's office and I would, he would say something about the brief I had prepared or the memo I had prepared. I could look at his face and tell what he thought. It was typically, I didn't like it or I didn't like that very well. And there's, there are ways to, in human interaction, to express feelings and reactions that I think are important. I worry about the young lawyers uh, in a setting like Charlotte where there are thousands of them who don't know each other, who don't talk to each other, and who, whose only communication is through uh, emails or some sort of impersonal uh, contact, uh, being able to work out some of the more difficult problems without creating huge bills uh, for their clients, without essentially making every molehill into a mountain, which it, it shouldn't be. That's a difficulty that I think we all need to uh, be concerned about because this thing could get out of hand to the point that nobody will be able to afford us or want us to try to solve their problems, and that's, that's not a good thing. And I can remember times in the classroom when a professor would say, now when some of you are in the legislature, uh, this statute is wrong. What the pub public policy of the state should be is this, and I hope if you get a chance you'll correct it. Or we'd be dealing with a case in which North Carolina had, in their view, the wrong rule from a policy standpoint. And they would say, now, when some of you are on the state Supreme Court, if you get a case in this area, uh, I hope you'll overrule this case and make the rule what it should be. Well, we would look at each other and sort of snicker. You know, we were 22 to 25 years old. None of us were going to be in the legislature. And Surely none of us were going to be on the Supreme Court, but four members of my class served in the state legislature, and one of us made it to the Supreme Court. Now, whether we got done the things that they suggested ought to be done is another question. I don't remember what they were, 
But I did get a keen sense, even in law school, that as a lawyer and as a public servant, if I got to be one, as many lawyers do, I had an obligation um, that getting the legal education I was getting instilled. Along the way, I, I think it's very important, uh, especially in our profession, to take a moment and identify those aspiring attorneys, new attorneys or even uh, older attorneys that perhaps that need help. I think all of us kind of need a, a word of inspiration or uh, maybe some uh, experience from a different perspective. So I've been lucky to have had many people uh, inspire and mentor and guide me along the ways. And because of that, I feel the responsibility to also give back. And a really good exchange occurs. In fact, the mentors often can learn from the mentees uh, by a response they may get that they've never had before. Key takeaways from module number two, mentoring. Think about having face-to-face -face meetings instead of sending an email or text. Get to know members of the bar throughout the state and develop your own professional network. Reach out to another lawyer in your network for advice or guidance when facing unique or complex issues or when feeling overwhelmed. Think about lawyers you admire and respect and try to understand what they are doing and the choices they are making that instill respect. Consider becoming a formal or informal mentor. Module number three, service. Service is defined as useful labor that does not produce a tangible commodity, a helpful act, or a contribution for the welfare of others. I believe that the call of a lawyer is to really speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. And that's our call. And often those who can't speak for themselves are those who um, can't afford to hire a lawyer. So we should give our best um, to those, I, I believe, we should give our best to those also. Everything we do, uh, first as a lawyer, everything we do reflects upon the judicial system and how it works and how people look at it. Even those things that we do outside of the profession. Um, you know, I know a, a lot of lawyers who are very active in their community and very active in the Bar Association or the State Bar or very active in the legislature. And those services, I think, reflect well on how people look upon our judicial system. Lawyers are more than just lawyers. They are people in a community and that people in a community that people look to for leadership, whether it's in a church or in a civic club or in a neighborhood or in a school. Uh, and lawyers have such great skills to be applied that they ought to be taking those skills into the community. It remains a highly noble profession. It is a helping profession. People come to lawyers um, and trust them with their personal lives, their financial matters. Uh, most of the time, people are not seeing a lawyer unless it's something that's truly important to them. So I think the fact that it is a service profession in the noblest tradition of that still holds. I, I, I find that young lawyers that are deciding to go into the profession want to find a place to plug in and help. And as an attorney in the small community in which I live, the place that I have found that I can fit into and help is just in the school system. And I go into the schools and volunteer in the schools and adopt classes and do character education in the school system on a weekly basis. How, what a blessing it is to, to get to do work that is challenging and fun and of service to other people. Uh, but in North Carolina, uh, when I started practicing, I'd been to school at Chapel Hill. There was nowhere in this state that I didn't know somebody. There was no county seat in North Carolina that I could not get on the phone and say, look, I've got a client, I want to refer somebody up your way, or to have people do the same with you. And that kind of uh, fellowship and closeness that's always been a part of our bar.
has been a, uh, just a delight in what we've done and, and the enduring relationships you make with, uh, uh, with people that you have the chance to work on things. And, and through the Bar Association, the Bar Association provides so many opportunities for you to, 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 to be able to, to be of service to your profession. And those, and those uh, opportunities invariably lead to your having connections with people that last all your life. When I came along, it really was the expectation. I would say, as I said earlier, it was part of the general ambience when I was in law school. It was part of the ambience when I was an undergraduate. People like Bill Friday and Bill Aycock, who were both lawyers but academic administrators, were, were preaching the giving something back theme song. Um, <clears throat> so it came all through school. When I joined my law firm, it was just expected that you were going to be in a civic organization or two. My, I want to say my second and third years with the law firm, I chaired the local March of Dimes campaign. I did something nobody had done before. I expanded it to the African American community. And I did it by picking a co-chair for the African American community that I had observed on a jury in an eminent domain case. She was a school teacher and just made a good impression on me. I did check her out with some of my contacts in the African American community, but everybody said, yes, she's good. I asked her to do it, she did it. We not only raised more money for the March of Dimes, we made it a, a full community effort. So there were things like that that were just expected when I came along. I find young lawyers today, I, I, I'll never forget, I had a clerk one year when I was on the Supreme Court. I was taking the last course one night a week at the University of Virginia that I needed for my SJD degree. He had been, had just graduated from there and um, <clears throat> I got him to be my driver. I remember thinking when I asked him to do it, I may be abusing this young man. Turns out he had a girlfriend in the business school and was delighted that I wanted him to go up there with me one night a week. But I remember discussing this with him and his, he was planning to go with one of the large farms in the state. He said, Justice Richard, I would love to do those things. He said, but that firm has told me they expect X number of billable hours of me every year, and I don't see how I can do that and do these other things. So that's a difference. Now, mine was not a mega firm when I came along. There were five lawyers when I started there, and 12 by the time I left. But um, he really didn't see how he could do that, and I think that's the case with many young lawyers these days. It's not universally the case. There certainly are still firms that encourage you know, the civic endeavors, but it is not on the same plane it was earlier. It simply is. But for the grace of God, there you are. I believe that. I believe that those that have mentored me and gave me an, an opportunity and allowed me to thrive, and if it wasn't for those people that had done things for me, I would not be where I am today. Um, whether that is uh, the ability to do positive things in uh, my community or the ability to provide for my family. There are people along the ways that have done things for me to allow me to be uh, blessed as I am. And so there's a responsibility. I think the responsibility as me as a member of my community, as a member of our, 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 our human race or as a member of our profession. And so um, in doing that, our profession should be encouraged. Um, we're, we're, we're looked at um, somewhat differently, and, and I think we should be. Um, so those that those opportunities that we can do to to um, further the profession and further the positive image of the profession, and also further uh, the positive image of our profession outside the profession. You know whether it's um, donating time for a nonprofit, you know, or donating time for uh, in the community, or donating resources, you know, free legal aid. Uh, donating finances, you know, money towards, you know, um, worthy projects. I think not only does your heart good 
and does our community good, but it does the profession good because people will look at you as a, an attorney and a barrister and see that not only are you a, a community member uh, and a professional of the community, but you're giving back. And so it's very important, I think, you know, as an individual, but also I think it's important as a, a member of, of a very noble profession. And I think it's folks who are practicing, men and women who are practicing, who first say, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm going to, I'm going to treat my clients right. I'm going to be driven first by um, I'm doing a good job for them, even if it means that I'm not going to make quite as much money in the beginning. I think people that do that, they find that what kind of comes around uh, goes around, and, and uh, what goes around comes around, and that they will, over a period of time, will develop a reputation that they really care about their clients, and so business will come to them and they'll have a better, op better opportunity to be able to make a living and, and the financial part will take care of itself. I think it's important to remember that if you can do something in the community, then you are a lawyer doing something in the community and that reflects well. And that can be something fairly minor. It can be coaching uh, an optimist soccer team. Um, it might be doing a little work in the men's club in your your church community. Or it may be something more substantial, perhaps appearing in the legislature or um, uh, being president of the local uh, Optimist Club. But it's important to do things outside the profession to let people know that lawyers are not bad people. I think if a lawyer is called upon to do something in his community, he needs to pitch in and help out. He cannot become a recluse of, of reading and writing briefs. Uh, and it helps one if you stay in touch with what's going on in the community, in your civic club, uh, boys and girls clubs, uh, environmental clubs. You, 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 you keep in touch with what's going on and it winds up helping you, helping you not only uh, present yourself and your client's uh, case in a professional way, but in an effective way. And I think that's what's good about it. I was always very clear that no matter how much money that I made, I was gonna have a part of my practice that was gonna be a poverty-based practice. I was gonna do some pro bono work. That's what we call it now. Uh, so I took what they called overflow cases from legal services. So when they had more clients than they could handle or people were just slightly above that wealth line for them, which I shouldn't call a wealth line because it's a poverty guideline, but they didn't qualify for their services, then I was on that list and I would take those cases on and do those cases for free. I was committed to that because I knew that there were people who needed representation who would never be able to pay the retainer fees that we were charging at the firm and the hourly rates, but they were the people who in many ways needed a lawyer the most. I think that wherever you are, whatever, the, the law firm or whatever organization, you need to be uh, aware of the diversities of the various people that are working there and put yourself in their shoes and think about what their life is like and, and how do you come across with what you might be saying thoughtlessly um, and, and just try to be um, a, a, a friend to them and to be uh, courteous to them. I love to be able to try to not get so, so busy with accomplishing my agenda, checking off my, my checklist, and doing these things that I feel like are really important things. And I love trying to take time to listen and really help. I can give you multiple examples of uh, young lawyers that I know who are active in their community doing the kind of service that we, we just talked about. They don't have to do that, and they certainly don't get paid for it. Now, they may be able to make contacts that provide business for them, but the overall image is that they are responsible individuals in the community. They're responsible family members. Um, they're doing the kinds of things that you would like for men and women who practice law to do. I would be in the law library at the firm with him at 12.30 at night trying to find a solution to a client's problem when sometimes there wasn't one. But he was very focused 
on the professional duty to do the very best um, that we could for our client. It's just been a delight to have work to do that, that, that you felt like was useful to your clients and, and, and often useful to your community and to your state. Even now with our students to say, if you're not serving, then I don't think that you're a good lawyer. I said, you can go and be as successful as you want and send me the clippings. I said, but if somewhere in there it doesn't tell me how you're helping somebody, some community group, helping a nonprofit, how are you making a difference? Lawyers are people at the, at the sort of end of the line for a lot of people. Last hope, really. Uh, and we've got to have really good people doing that. There's human disorder that lawyers have been called in to try to fix. That's a pretty darn important role in society. Uh, and courtrooms are sort of the last straw for most of those people. So I want the very best people, men and women, in those courtrooms defending the rights of people, defending the rights of entities, uh, attempting to get at the values of being a lawyer. I mean, the, 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 for me, the values of being a lawyer are getting at the law, doing it right, getting at the truth, and then ultimately, getting justice. I mean, if there's a code for us, it ought to be that. The law, uh, truth, and ultimately, justice. It's a pretty high calling. Key takeaways from module number three, service. Lawyers are entrusted with the most important aspects of their clients' lives and businesses. The law is a service profession. Being active and engaged in your community makes you a better lawyer and reflects well on the judicial system. When trying to find time to do things outside of your professional practice, remember even minor or limited community activities can have an impact and make a difference in someone's life. This video series was inspired by the life, work, and writings of Judge McKnight a U.S. District Court judge for the Western District of North Carolina in Charlotte until his death in November 2004. Judge McKnight described the great tradition of professionalism among North Carolina lawyers in an essay entitled Thrasymachus at the Coffee Shop, which is provided in the materials for this program. Before each module in this presentation, you've seen a brief segment of a presentation given by Judge McKnight during his last public appearance at a dinner honoring the federal judiciary in Charlotte on November 18, 2004. We will conclude with a final segment from his remarks that evening. With the honor of being in the legal profession come significant responsibilities. I remember so well seeing engraved in stone on the ends of court in London these words, defend the children of the poor punish the wrongdoer. It has been gratifying to me to see how many attorneys in this district take these responsibilities deeply to heart. And if you have not already become involved in these matters, I would greatly encourage you to do so. This concludes the presentation you may access the materials from the link to this program on the NC Bar Foundation website. And please provide your feedback, both positive and negative, about this program on the online survey that follows this program. Thank you for watching this program.